On today's show, we'll react to the latest with Nate McMillan and a bombshell of a story on Friday afternoon about Nate McMillan potentially, uh, let's just say considering, resigning at this point from the Atlanta Hawks. And beyond that, a breakdown of Hawks-Lakers as the Hawks let one get away on this Friday evening. We'll have all that and more coming up. You are Locked On Hawks, your daily Atlanta Hawks podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team, every day. Hello, friends. Welcome to episode 1379 of the Lots on Hawks podcast. I am your host, Brad Rowland, coming to you on a Friday evening here on December 30th, the final show of 2022. And today's episode is brought to you by Bet Online. Bet Online has you covered this season with more props, odds, and lines than ever before. Bet Online is where the game starts. I also want to thank you at the top of the podcast for making this podcast the Locked on Hawks podcast, your first listen each and every day. Check us out across podcast platforms. I love that you've already done that if you're listening to this podcast somewhere. But uh, spread the word about the podcast, and I really do thank you for joining us on today's episode. Today's show is going to be kind of an interesting one that we're going to do uh, at the top of the podcast, uh, some reactions to a big story that dropped on Friday about Nate McMillan. And then later on in the show, we'll dive into what became a loss for the Hawks at home against the Lakers. Spoiler alert, a pretty bad loss, in my opinion, for Atlanta here at home as they fall to 17 and 19 on the season in their last game of 2022. They're now three, uh, sorry, they're now 0 and 3 in the last three games and 4 and 9 in the last 13 games. So uh, not a whole lot of excitement there on that. But we'll first start this podcast talking about Nate McMillan and about 90 minutes before Nate did his pregame availability against the Lakers on Friday, about 4 o'clock Eastern time, something like that. Sham Sharani at The Athletic reported that Nate McMillan has, quote, strongly considered resigning from his position, citing league sources. Of note, Shams also reported in the same piece that no resignation is imminent for McMillan and that only positive conversations, is the way he phrased it, have taken place between Nate and Landry Field since Landry took over as being the general manager. And after the shakeup of the front office about 10 days ago, Sharani also did go as far as to say that McMillan, quote, appears to be near the end of his tenure with the Hawks after the season, unless there was a resignation before then, end quote. And that is a pretty definitive sentence. Uh, it doesn't obviously say anything that's absolutely black and white, but um, him being close to his end of his tenure is notable because he's under contract for two more seasons after this one. So that doesn't mean that he's going to be gone anytime, anytime soon, but it does go to sort of the buzz. I mean, Millen is not likely to be the head coach next season. That's been kind of out there, and it was certainly getting stronger as of this reporting, and uh, maybe we'll see how that goes the rest of the season. But I'll have more of this in a second, but I do want to play you Nate McMillan's response. So as I said, this all dropped just an hour and a half or so before the uh, his pregame media availability. He had not talked this morning, so it was all fresh. And uh, this is about a three-minute video, longer than I usually would post, uh, just kind of in full, but it's uh, probably good to get the entire context. First, you will hear the voice of Lauren Williams asking a question of the AJC to, to Nate, and then you'll hear a follow-up from Caleb Johnson, 92.9. And uh, this basically is like the full context of what Nate had to say about the reporting. So here is that. We'll be right back after this with, with my own uh, analysis and thoughts on the latest. You guys want to start. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I, know I know you've responded to reports that have come out before about things that happened in the organization, but at any time have you considered resigning this season? You know, I mean, uh, I read that article briefly. Uh, I've never spoke to that reporter before. Um, I think the last two weeks he's written a couple articles with some sources in our organization. Uh, that are making some comments about me and some things that I'm saying and doing. Um, look, at the end of the year, I'll do as I, I've always done. At the end of the season, I talk with my family and, um, you know, see if I still have that, faint, that flame, um, that fire to continue next season. But that's the end of the season. Um, all of us, Think about retiring, um, <laughs> but that's at the end of the season, you know. So I, we're going to move on past that that story. Uh, you know, we have a race uh, to prepare for. Uh, we're trying to get our guys healthy, and uh, you know, make them make another run at the playoffs. Uh, but you know, the, the things that were reported. Uh, Look, I'm here to coach this team, and uh, you know I've talked to Tony uh, many times, and um, you know our goal is to make the playoffs, and that's what I'm working towards. 
So we squashed that, right? All right. <laughs> Nate, just a little bit further. Um, simply from the fact of, I know there was, there was a practice where we we're all having a conversation with you about um, you know, your growth as a coach and just how you've gone about this experience. Um, has there been, just for a point of clarification, has there ever been a point uh, this season where you felt like you couldn't uh, relate or communicate to your players? I mean, look, guys, things like that happen every day. They happen every day. You know, um, you know, when you when you uh, drop a game, you know, you're trying to figure out how to uh, get that team uh, back right and doing the right thing. So you always you're always going to be looking. I'm, I mean, I'm 58 years old. Okay, I've been in this business for a long time, uh, but that's been throughout my career. You know, but as I said to you. Uh, that retiring and moving on, that is a conversation I have at the end of the year. Not right now. Okay. Bob, you think about retiring? No, sir. No, no, no. Okay. <laughs> All right, so a lot to parse there with Nate and what he had to say in that extended answer. Uh, the part that I kind of noticed the most was uh, him saying that at the end of the year, he'll, he'll do as he's always done, and that basically talking about um, how everyone has considered a retirement at some point in time, and uh, that's always at the end of the season. Uh, importantly, Nate did not deny the reporting in that answer. Now, or at any point in the media availability, obviously there were more questions. They were mostly tied to the game. That's why I'm not, not playing the entire thing for you. But uh, – Obviously, it's notable to me and others that uh, were around this press conference that he did not deny the report. He talked around it for sure and said uh, his normal process is to assess the stuff at the end, at the end of the season. But uh, this is not a denial in my mind from Nate McMillan. Now, I'm not the same level of, of, of a reporter and insider and source god that Shums is, but I can pass along that I have heard the reporting is accurate, that Nate has, in fact, considered resigning. I know some Hawks fans took Nate's uh, response as like a denial. And, um, you know, I know Steve Coonan, uh, the Hawks CEO, went on the radio and gave some pretty strong pushback to Shams. But uh, from what I can gather, uh, I think the reporting is accurate, that Nate has at least considered it. I've heard that from multiple sources tonight. Again, I'm not like the source person that Shams is, but I, I'm not just uh, throwing that out there. I think it's definitely accurate from what I can glean. And look, the Hawks have every reason to push back on this publicly. And I, know, I know Steve Coonan has obviously said what he said, but uh, I think the reporting is accurate from what I can glean. I've also said multiple times since the early December reporting on the spat between Nate and Trey Young that I've heard that Nate is safe from firing at this point. That still is the case. I know Shams included that in his piece as well on Friday that the Hawks, quote, have wanted to finish out the season with McMillan on the sideline, end quote. That was echoed again by Jeff Schultz of The Athletic, who is well-sourced in the city for sure, and he shared that Atlanta's preferences to not fire Nate McMillan at this point. And basically, no one that I have talked to that I trust uh, thinks the Hawks are going to be really anywhere close to firing Nate right now. And if anything, the tone is that they actually kind of actively want him to stay right now during the season and not resign over the course of the campaign. In fact, Shams did some TV today on Friday and said uh, the following in a direct quote, the Hawks want Nate McMillan to finish out the season, end quote. Now, that does not mean that they're not going to uh, fire him or maybe have a mutual parting in the ways at the end of the season. That's definitely possible, but... Everything that is out there, public reporting, what I can gather is that the Hawks are not ready to fire Nate right now. Keep that in mind as well. Um, also, again, he has a lot of money left on his deal. That's also part of the uh, part of the calculus here. I think that might be part of why he may not be wanting to resign. Now, on the other hand, uh, he's been coaching in the NBA for a long time, and I think Nate is at least capable of walking away from the money. I don't think he's necessarily going to hold out just for that. Uh, and look, I know that Nate is not popular with Hawks fans right now. Uh, he is well-respected for sure, uh, famously. During the run two years ago, I was seen as being too low on Nate because I didn't think he was like this earth shattering uh, coaching difference that some fans wanted him to be during during that run. And now I think uh, I'm seen as being too high on him because I'm not saying he should be fired every night. I think Nate is uh, just a, a veteran coach that has some strengths and weaknesses and all that fun stuff. But he is well respected in the NBA. That is not uh, really up for debate. Like Nate is very well respected. Not Does that mean everybody loves Nate that's played for him? No, definitely not. But he's in the top 20 all time and wins like this is a guy who's been around for a long time, was a player, knows everybody. He commands kind of a different approach and that someone that's more unseasoned, that's like a first time head coach. He's going to be given a lot more gravitas than that. And there's plenty of time to discuss like what happens next. And I know people always wanted me to kind of wait, wait on the next coach of the Hawks, whether it's Quinn Snyder or whatever, Kenny Atkinson, all kinds of names that are out there. I'm not ready to do any of that just yet. 
Nate stole the coach of the team. Um, and look, uh, that's uh, it's kind of where we are at this point in time. If you made me guess right now, if Nate's still the head coach next season, I would say no. That's kind of the reporting that's out there and what I've heard behind the scenes. But that doesn't mean it's definitely going to happen that way uh, or that he won't. Um, the Hawks won't make a run. I think he probably needs to have the Hawks make a run later in the season in the playoffs and having a good end of the season to actually stay on long term. Um, but, you know, we'll see. That's kind of where I am at this point in time. Lastly, though, on the Sharani report, because there was a lot to get into, and I always recommended people everybody reading the entire thing for the context. He made public that the Hawks have, quote, let go of, end quote, three prominent front office voices, Rod Higgins, Stephen Giles, and Derek Pierce. Not household names outside of the uh, basketball circles, but Rod Higgins used to be the uh, – GM of the Charlotte Hornets. He's been a, an advisor for a long time with the Hawks. He is uh, obviously, I don't, I don't think he was uh, terribly active like day to day right now. He was more in that advisor role. They're not going to be around anymore. The other two kind of made more waves and got some more surprise reactions. Giles was the leader of the pro scouting department for the Hawks, which is kind of, you know, the pro scouting is like, you know, knowing the, knowing the entire league as it is now, both in terms of scouting for opponents and also scouting for trades. And then Pierce, was a highly respected name in scouting circles and someone who was certainly around the, uh, the, the personnel department. So um, I know those are kind of notable departures in the middle of the season. There's always some uncertainty about what's going to happen next with the Travis Schlenk thing. Uh, I know Travis maybe uh, was, was closer to those guys. I'm not, I'm not sure how that all breaks down. But there's been some questions that I've gotten about, like, who the number two is under Landry Fields. I don't really have an answer for you on that. I know Nick Russell's name has been thrown around a lot, but I'm not sure he's in that, in that situation. But there isn't, like, a whole lot of infrastructure around Landry at this point in time. Uh, there's a Fox Sports report out there about Grant Lifman getting, getting a, a promotion. He's a former writer who was brought in last year to the organization. So all kinds of uh, – uncertainty but uh, at the very least uh, I, I can confirm from what I heard uh, today that uh, those three players so sorry those three uh, front office voices that Sean's reported are no longer around and those are three prominent guys who are well respected so that's notable as well so all in all the vibe is not great <laughs> obviously we'll get to the game which is also part of this as well but taking a step back from a one game or even a three game or a 10 game sample size just kind of talking about organizationally right now it's kind of a mess by all accounts I got a text that I did share on Twitter it was unsolicited. Um, someone I talk to about basketball all the time, but I would say is a well-placed source in basketball circles um, that said, basically, this is a complete mess. And uh, yeah, it seems that way, but I, we'll, ne we'll never know all of it from the outside. I know I'm pretty plugged in with the Hawks, but uh, organizationally, front office wise, ownership wise, it's kind of uncertain. The Travis Schlenk thing didn't, uh, it was kind of a mess at the end with the way that all went down in the middle of the season. Um, now three people that are you know, sort of prominent in the organization, no, no longer going to be there. You have this Nate reporting out there about he might he might want to walk away at some point. You have the already well well publicized Trey and Nate spat earlier. You have uh, all kinds of stuff over and basically in like a month span. So it's a lot has happened, and uh, I'm not getting the feeling that it's necessarily calming down now. And uh, and on top of all of that. The Hawks are not playing well at the moment. So we'll get into that in a second with regard to tonight's game. But the fact that they are sub 500 after an offseason where everyone, including Tony Wrestler, and I would say especially Tony Wrestler, was banging the drum about how the Hawks had to have changes and get better and have all this urgency. And um, they're basically the same team or a worse team than they were a year ago on paper, at least in terms of their performance so far through 36 games. So a lot of uncertainty. I'm not, I'm not one to paint a dire picture. I don't want to say that nothing is uh, possibly going to be turning around because I think the Hawks are, are definitely still better than this, that, that they've been so far this year. But in terms of organizational turmoil, stability, um, structure, um, you know, all that stuff that you want in an organization, uh, the vibes are not good from what I can gather and what's already been basically reported and put out there in the last month or so. So not going great at this stage. We'll have more on that in the future for sure. But uh, after a break to hear from our sponsors, I will dive in to Hawks and Lakers from Friday evening. Imagine for a moment you're hanging out with some friends, putting back a few drinks, a few drinks because of a few too, too many drinks. And as the evening comes to an end, people start to head out. You think of calling for a ride, but you think, no, nah, you live nearby. You'll make it home okay. It's no big deal. What are the odds that you'll get pulled over anyway? And even so, what's the worst that could happen? Your insurance goes up, or you lose your license, or maybe you lose your job, or you tow your car, or even perhaps kill someone. Everyone knows about the risks of driving drunk, and these, the results are often tragic and often deadly. However, that does not stop everyone from getting behind the wheel while driving under the influence. That's why police officers are out there right now looking for impaired drivers on the roads to save lives. If you think you're okay to drive after a few drinks, think again. Play it safe and plan ahead to get a ride. It takes one mistake to change your life or the life of someone else forever. Drive sober or get pulled over. It isn't often that I wait this long to talk about a game on a, on a night when the game actually happened, but big news. So I wanted to throw the Nate stuff at the top of the podcast, but, uh, 
essentially, the Hawks did not play very well in this one. They lose 130-121 to 121 to the Lakers. LA had lost five of the last six coming in. No Anthony Davis. And honestly, without Anthony Davis, the Lakers might be the worst defensive team in the league. They are not a good roster. Obviously, LeBron James is a huge factor. LeBron James is awesome and uh, one of the best players of all time. And he was he showed that tonight for sure. But uh, roster-wise, even with the Hawks being shorthanded in this game, and they were with Al Capella and DeAndre Hunter, um, it wasn't like the Hawks were at a disadvantage talent-wise in this game. And they were also playing at home. No rest disadvantage. Uh, Hunter, again, misses his third straight game. Capella missed this one as well. He's actually missed six of the last seven. Um, no, no AD or Laundry Walker. Trey Young did return for the Hawks in this one. Um, but but online, our friends over there made the Hawks six and a half point favorites. And people were surprised by that because of the way the Hawks have been playing. But Look, the Lakers were three and seven in the last 10 games without Anthony Davis. They have a minus six net rating for the season with AD off the floor. Um, again, LeBron is LeBron, but this roster is not good. And uh, even their writers, who I, I know a few of them that cover the team every day, they were um, not surprised that the Hawks were favorites, favorites in this game because the Hawks should have been favorites in this game. And that kind of leads me to the overall takeaway that we'll get into later on about Atlanta. This being a pretty bad loss for the Hawks, but alas, We'll dive into the game flow right now. And they started with Griffin uh, at the three in this game with Bogey off the bench. No surprise there. It was John Collins and, and a Kong Wu basically the entire game, uh, along with Jalen Johnson, the three of them defending LeBron James because DeAndre Hunter would have been a primary guy to throw at LeBron just given his size, but they don't really have a ready-made wing defense replacement. So they kind of used all their bigs on LeBron in this game, which was not necessarily perfect, but it's kind of what they have to do. The Hawks did lead early on with the Lakers starting out slow. They missed like five of their first six shots. It was a funny sequence early on that kind of laid the groundwork for the entire game. Uh, the officiating was brutal in this spot. Tony, Tony Brothers is like one of my least favorite officials. Ben Taylor was involved in this game as well. Um, Trey got fouled very clearly early in the game. And on the ensuing possession, LeBron also got fouled very clearly and nothing was called on either side. And it was like, all right, it's going to be a long night at the office officiating wise. And that was definitely the case in this game. There was a great defensive possession, actually, that I wanted to point out, but AJ Griffin, one on one against Austin Reeves, who had a rough night for the Lakers. AJ forced turnover on that possession, and the Hawks did actually force a lot of turnovers in this game. That was their one bright spot defensively with some habit creation. But Atlanta led by nine mid first quarter because AJ Griffin had back to back threes. He had struggled a little bit before this, but actually had a good shooting night in this one. Uh, rotation wise, it was like an eight and a half man rotation for the Hawks in this game. Bogdanovich and Aaron Holiday played uh, as the first subs, and then Jalen Johnson and Frank Kaminsky made an appearance in the first quarter. I didn't love that, and Nate did not do it in the second half, which is notable and I think smart uh, to play to not play him after that. I didn't see the reason to play Kaminsky, honestly, in this matchup. I get it on certain nights when you, again, without Capella, where you just kind of need more size, but the Lakers played pretty small and uh, didn't think there was a need for that much at all. Um, just didn't need it. Anyway, it didn't bite them necessarily. They were actually, I think they were dead even in those minutes that he played, but um, yeah, it wasn't like they were making huge strides either. Uh, anyway, the def defensively, it was kind of a mess the entire game, but especially uh, it got worse as the game went along, I'll say. The Hawks did lead by 10 at the end of the first quarter and we're in a great position. Trey actually scored on a drive with like four seconds to go in the first quarter and got up very, very gingerly and slowly went to the locker room briefly and was uh, the Hawks called it a, a back contusion. He was asked after the game if he was uh, hurt, basically, and he got gave kind of a long answer about how he's a small guy playing with Giants. He's kind of always banged up, but he, he'll, he'll be fine. So we'll see if that kind of lingers, but he was not probably 100% in this one. The Hawks were good offensively in the first quarter, but and then defensively, they got bailed out by the Lakers missing a bunch of shots in the first quarter, but that kind of stopped after that. Um, later in the first half, there was some foul trouble from the Hawks, which became a theory, uh, sorry, a, a theme the rest of the way. Collins and Akongwu both had foul trouble to varying degrees. Collins ended up um, fouling out. Akongwu, I think, ended up with four, but had four for a lot of the second half. Um, they, they went back to Trey once he was able to come back in, which probably was helpful. He sat longer than usual, but that's probably because of the injury. He was actually at the table for a long time as well. The Hawks, though, were up by 15 points with about five minutes left in the first half. And I'm flagging that now because from that point forward, the Hawks got blitzed in the last two and a half quarters. Uh, it was immediately an 11-2 run by the Lakers to get back to six really fast. I thought DeJounte Murray had a really rough stretch at the end of the first half where he got very ISO heavy, like kind of got into it with Russell Westbrook a little bit one-on-one -on -one and maybe LeBron a little bit and just kind of tried to do a little bit too much. And I think he went on like, pretty much ISO ball for like five possessions out of maybe six or seven. It was very, very ISO heavy. There was one bright spot with Jalen Johnson getting a steal and a dunk. And uh, it's a reminder, Jalen Johnson, his head was at the rim on that on that dunk in transition. He is a monster. He's like all of 6'10 and really athletic and really springy. That was a, a, a pretty impressive display physically from him. 
But the Lakers got going a little bit, especially with, once Collins left the game with the foul trouble. Um, L.A. scored 20 points in the last five minutes of the first half, and it was off and running from there. The Hawks were up by five at the halftime break, but it had, it had been 15, and they kind of let that go a little bit. And then uh, after halftime, obviously not the best in the world. Um, the offense was better in the first half than the second half for the Hawks, but again, as a reminder, the Lakers are bad defensively, and the Hawks were not necessarily able to take advantage of all of that. Uh, they gave up 15 fast break points in the first half. That was the theme of what's to come later on. In the third quarter, uh, a Kongu actually got his third foul right out of the gate with Collins having three fouls. He did have one big help side block on Austin Reeves later on in the quarter. But um, the middle of the quarter was kind of an up and down show on both sides of the floor. And that kind of the Hawks were holding serve for the most part. And then they kind of stopped holding serve. There was the uh, nightly, what I call the obscene Troy Young pass as he threw this beautiful cross court set up pass to AJ Griffin from like 50 feet away for a corner three, but LeBron got going. He had six points in a row and uh, it was a 17 to four run by the Lakers mid quarter to take the lead. LA had not led since it was two, nothing until the middle of the third quarter. And then that, from that point forward, they were leading basically the entire rest of the game on some level. It was a mess of a stretch overall. Also, the Hawks stopped scoring. They were 6 of 17 from the floor at one point in the third quarter. Trey did find it a little bit with three straight um, scoring possessions. He had six points in three possessions, but that was kind of it. They couldn't get any stops. It was a team-wide issue, but I thought LeBron in particular, uh, in his way that he operates, was targeting Jalen Johnson and Trey Young a lot in that stretch. Bogey also had a really, really, really rough second half defensively, I thought. But uh, they were down by three at the end of the first uh, – sorry, at the end of the third quarter, the Hawks were. But uh, it was a mess. The Lakers scored – sorry, shot 68% from the floor – in the third quarter, and uh, from the middle of second quarter to the end of the third quarter, the Lakers had 56 points in about 16 and a half minutes. That is a lot of points in that stretch. Offensively, it wasn't horrible, but it was not good enough to keep up with the Lakers. In the fourth, Collins had a foul. His, his fifth uh, in the first like minutes of the fifth of the fourth quarter had to come out of the game again. Um, kind of the auto foul out stuff that happens a lot of the time with foul trouble. Collins had to come back in a little bit too quickly, I probably thought, but still they kind of had to do that. They did lead again briefly after a couple of threes by Bogdanovich and Aaron Holiday, and Bogey had a great uh, drive and drop off for a Kongu for a uh, for an easy bucket around LeBron later on, but. From that point forward, it was kind of back and forth for a while, but still unable to get stops. There was a couple of nice interior buckets from Kongwu. Um, offensively, he had one where he sealed LeBron kind of impressively around the rim for a layup and then an offensive rebound bucket from him as well. But mostly the Hawks just couldn't get stops. LeBron went crazy. He had a three with about four minutes to go to put the, put the Lakers up by four points to force a timeout. At one point, he was like 15 of 19 from the floor. It was just ludicrous stuff. Kong would travel in the next possession. Uh, the bench was very not happy with that call, but I actually think it was a travel, just in raw, uh, the actual raw rule of traveling. Um, then they kind of dodged a bullet by allowing three extra possessions on one possession with offensive rebounds, but they were able to uh, get a stop anyway. But Murray missed a couple of tough mid-rangers. LeBron had a three-point play on a drive, and it was uh, suddenly down by seven with two minutes to go. Uh, that was when Collins fouled out. I'm not sure that he was the one that actually fouled LeBron in that play, but alas, um, Murray did make back-to-back -back threes at one point to keep the Hawks kind of breathing because they were down by seven. It went down to four. It went down to three at one point. That gave the Hawks a little bit of life, but that was kind of the end of the uh, optimism because – from there, they allowed a bucket to Russell Westbrook. Murray turned it over, another bucket in transition. And it was suddenly seven with about 50 seconds to go, and that was kind of it. Uh, Trey did score to get it to five, but the Lakers then scored right back, and uh, that was basically the end of the game. So we'll get into the takeaways and my player observations, my breakdowns, and all that, all that stuff in a second. But basically, uh, before we get into all that, the uh, defensively, it was, it was really rough. The Hawks were able to score um, – in a raw sense, like just a box score numbers sense, enough points and enough points per possession, enough efficiency to stay alive in a good context. But when you throw in LA's defense and you, when you throw in the way that they were able to score in this game, it was not enough. And defensively, it was a mess. Offensively, it was just okay. And okay is not going to be enough to get a win in this spot. So after I break from, to hear from our sponsors, we'll dive into the overall takeaways and the observations from this game as well as the individual player breakdowns. But uh, here we are for the word from our sponsors. Today's show is brought to you by Rocket Money, and you can say goodbye to last year's outdated methods of managing your money and say hello to Rocket Money. Rocket Money is formerly known as Truebill. It's a personal finance app that finds and cancels subscriptions that you don't want, monitors your spending, and helps you lower your bills all in one place. More than 80% of people have subscriptions that they actually have forgotten about, like a perhaps a streaming service that you bought to watch one show or a free trial that you never actually use and forgot to cancel. Rocket Money will also help, help you quickly and easily identify your subscriptions that you can uh, stop paying for the ones that you actually don't want. And Rocket Money also makes cancellations very easy. 
All you have to do is find the actual subscription in your app, press cancel, and Rocket Money will take care of the rest. No more long hold times with customer service or a bunch of emails back and forth. More than 3 million people have used Rocket Money at this point in time. The average person saved up to $720 per year. Rocket Money is also huge for someone like me who manages a ton of subscriptions for my various jobs. It's already saved me multiple times for paying stuff, paying for stuff that I actually didn't really need to have anymore. And stop throwing your money away. Cancel those subscriptions that you don't want and manage your expenses the right way and the easy way by going to rocketmoney.com slash locked on NBA right now. One more time, that is rocketmoney.com slash locked on NBA. All right, and defensively in this game, it was largely terrible, to be honest. I'll just be candid about that. The Lakers scored 88 points in the final 29 minutes. They shot 60% from the floor in the second half and uh, some damning stats here from the shot chart. The Lakers were 19 of 25 in the paint in the second half and 17 of 22 at the rim in the second half. Those are terrible numbers in terms of attempts allowed. Also just conversion rate from Lakers in those numbers. A 125 defensive rating for the full game for Atlanta, and that is with the Lakers having a very, very slow start in the first quarter. I don't have the numbers in front of me, but I'm, I'm going to guess the number was like 140 per, per 100 possessions after the first quarter. It was that bad. Now, part of that, I want to emphasize, part of that is LeBron was fantastic. And as an appreciator of NBA basketball, um, I will just note, I know Hawks fans don't want to hear this, but LeBron was brilliant. It is, it is what it is. LeBron had 47 points, 10 rebounds, 9 assists. He was in total control of the game. And that is worth at least keeping in mind that the Hawks ran into a buzzsaw with one of the best players of all time operating at a very high level. That does matter. But it was also a lot of breakdowns from the Hawks defensively throughout the game. The Hawks allowed 74 points in the paint. That is a sky high number. Also 23 fast break points allowed. Those are atrocious numbers, basically. The Lakers shot 66% on twos. They have 34 assists. That's a really high number. They did uh, turn the ball over a bunch, but... Generally speaking, the perimeter defense for the Hawks, like it was against Indiana, was atrocious in this game. It, it just was. And then you throw in some foul trouble. You throw in the Hawks having to kind of try to play small because they're already already down Capella and, and Kaminsky's not really playable. All that stuff wrapped into one, no Hunter, et cetera. It made for a really ugly situation defensively, and it was untenable because even if the Hawks had played a B-plus, A-minus offensive game in this game, they still would have lost because they couldn't get stops. Um, I will say... Capella and Hunter are huge losses on defense. I think Capella more so for sure, as I've talked about a number of times. If you're, if you're a listener to the podcast, um, I think Capella is extremely valuable, and the Hawks have built their team around him defensively in a pretty clear way. The Hawks are now 2-7 and seven this season without Clint, and uh, everything changes without him. Obviously, offensively, they can play some bumps that are better without him for sure, but defensively, he is their anchor, and that is uh, very much missed. And if they had him in this game, he would have helped a lot. Um, Hunter, though, is – a huge loss defensively as well. Like I've argued that Hunter has kind of maybe been a little bit overrated in his career. He's not played at an extremely high level overall, but defensively he is by far their best defensive wing. It's not even close, especially when you factor in size. Um, there are guys who are good defenders on this roster. Your Trent Forrest types, Aaron Holiday is pesky, et cetera. Um, but as far as wings are concerned, he is head and shoulders better than everybody else. And he would have been a good option on LeBron. All that's all, all that to say, Part of the explanation, again, just like just just like part of the explanation was LeBron going crazy. Part of it, again, is no Capella and no Hunter, but it's not acceptable anyway. Because look, the Lakers were down Anthony Davis. The Lakers were shorthanded in this game as well, and the Hawks have to be better with what they have on, on the roster. Uh, we'll get into individual stuff in a second, but the perimeter defense has been basically terrible for a lot of the last week plus, and uh, that is a big reason why the Hawks have lost more than they've won in this stretch. Anyway, offensively, it was fine. The way I would say it was kind of fine. It's not, like, not they had a 114 offensive rating. It's not that's a good number. It's not an elite number. It's a good number. But when you factor in, the Lakers are again probably a bottom three defensive team in the league without Anthony Davis on the floor. Their personnel is not good. They play small, etc. Um, just to only post that. And again, I, I know it's weird to say only, but really only post that. That's not a good. It's not. It's not good enough. They were good enough on twos, 59% from the, from the two-point range in this game, but 11 of 38 from three. Uh, that's going to happen sometimes. You're just going to be cold. But they had 17 fewer attempts at the rim than the Lakers did. That's a, a number that's going to get you beaten. Most, more often than not, they took 38 mid-range attempts. Um, that's not ridiculous, but they took a lot of, like, makeable but kind of difficult mid-rangers, and that's kind of those are uh, bad number shots most of the time. They were below average of the glass, below average of the free throw creation game, and accuracy at the free throw line. They missed six free throws. So all kinds of stuff offensively. Again, it wasn't terrible. Defensively, it was terrible. Offensively, it wasn't, but it wasn't good enough. As for the players, 
and this one is before we get out of here on this podcast and it's going to be kind of a long one on this friday into saturday and uh you know it's the last one of the year so here we are uh player wise only eight and a half guys play basically kaminsky was uh you know he was plus one i don't i think he was he didn't really earn that i think defensively he was a mess in his brief time Aaron Holiday was the clear eighth man in this one, 13 minutes, played three points, three rebounds. He had one big three, but he was kind of just uh, out there. He was okay. But this isn't a matchup where you like desperately need Aaron Holiday because the Lakers don't really have a, an on-ball player other than LeBron is going to get you beat. And you can't really put Aaron Holiday on LeBron. Jalen Johnson was good in the first half, I thought, pretty active, 10 points in the first half. In the second half, uh, he got teed off on my LeBron for sure. And, you know, part of that is just that he's a young, inexperienced player. Part of that is like some, there was some effort and stuff that was a little bit weird from Jalen. He had 15 points and seven rebounds. Actually, that's a career high for him from, from the scoring perspective. Two steals and a block. So, like, the numbers look okay. I think he was pretty shaky after halftime. But, you know, still, it wasn't like he was, like, the only one that was bad. Uh, just that he was a little bit exposed for his positioning and his defensive stuff along the way. Bogey had a rough night for sure. 17 points, yes, but 19 shot attempts. He was four of seven on twos, but three of 12 on threes. Um, and defensively, it was really rough. I'm, I, I like Bogey a lot, and I am definitely pro-Bogey in the in a uh, normal overall sense. But defensively, since he returned this year, it's been an adventure. That was the case in this game. Up to the starters. Uh, Collins played the fewest minutes because of the foul trouble and the foul out eventually. I thought he was pretty good when he played other than the, uh, the other than the fouls, but you can't like, you can't just overstate the fouls. The fouls do matter for sure. Um, that was, uh, he was too, over, he's too over aggressive. Uh, when Collins plays the five, he fouls more than he plays the four, which kind of makes sense if you think about it, but also, uh, that he has to stay on the floor and that's part of the issue there. Um, he had nine rebounds in 23 minutes. He was effective around the rim, but Oh, three from three as well. Uh, definitely not a good game overall from him, but you know, the foul trouble was the foul trouble. Uh, AJ Griffin was the second guy who played the fewest in the starting lineup. 25 minutes, 13 points. I believe he had eight or 10 of those in the first quarter. So he definitely cooled off. I think he made his first four shots and then missed five of his last six. Um, he was effective early, had two assists, but uh, kind of a non-factor in the second half. And then defensively, he is below average at this point. Um, Trey had a interesting game, let's say. 29 points and eight assists. And it's hard to not be good with those numbers, but I thought Trey didn't play well, like pretty much at all. Um, he had a couple of stretches. There was the one in the third quarter. Where he, I think he scored three straight times. He had a couple of great passes because he's only going to have a couple, couple of great passes. But defensively, he was torched in this game. And then offensively, he wasn't efficient. He had 29 points on 28 shots. That's not terrible. But I thought that um, for someone to have 29 and eight, he was um, not good um, by that objective standard that he sets for himself, obviously. He said that after the game as well, he's got to make more shots. It wasn't even just about that, though. Defensively, I think he was worse than usual. And just like the, the process was not was not great offensively in this game. Murray, kind of the same thing. He had a couple of like really, really questionable shot selection things. Still ended up with 20, 20 points, nine assists, seven rebounds. Um, he was more efficient than Trey was as a scorer by a little bit. But the combination of Trey and DeJounte, 49 points, yes. But also, I believe it was on 46 shooting possessions. That's just not it's not great efficiency. It's not bad, but again, given what we talked about earlier with the Lakers defense, they need to be a little bit better as a pairing. Uh, and then a Congo played 43 minutes. That is a career high for him. Uh, 17 points, eight rebounds, two steals, three blocks. He was active. He was pretty good. He couldn't save everybody defensively. I, I don't think that he was the problem, nor was Collins defensively. I think they were okay. Were they great? No, but I think it was more perimeter based as the defensive issues were. But I thought Onyeka did what he could have done in this game. I thought he was totally fine, played well. Maybe not quite as well as he did last week, a couple of games where he, I thought he was, had his best special of the entire season. But I thought Onyeka was solid and had to play a ton and that was definitely leaving it all out there when he was out there. So anyway, uh, at the end of the day, the Hawks closed 2022 with three straight losses. They are now four and nine in the last 13 games. And they are now 17 and 19 for the season. Uh, none of that is good. Um, on the bright side, as I record this podcast late, late, late into the night on Friday into Saturday, they are the nine seed in the East, and they are only two games out of being the six seed. So they have the ability to make a run here. Uh, they're not playing well in any way, shape, or form at this point in time. But while visions of a top three, four seed are probably gone at the stage, realistically. They could still avoid the play if they were to get it together, but I, I, don't, I, I don't want to oversell either. The Hawks are not playing well, and the vibes, as I said before on the, at the beginning of the podcast, are not great. And uh, the schedule is not super easy from here either because now they have to go after a break on Saturday. Um, they will fly to California on Sunday for a four-game California road trip. It is 
it is the Warriors, it is the Kings, and then it is the, it, it, then it is the Lakers Clippers duo next week. So four games in a row in California. It's like an 11 day road trip for Atlanta, four games and uh, lots of late night basketball. I will uh, have a lot of coffee brewing in, uh, in Atlanta for that coverage. But uh, you know, the Warriors without Steph is a winnable game for sure. As we'll probably get into a little bit more later on in the weekend and into next week, but that's Monday, but just having to go out West is never easy. No team likes to do that. And if the Hawks could go out there and maybe play 500 basketball, it'd probably be acceptable. No one's gonna be excited about that, but that's where we are at the stage. So, Overall, a rough day for the Hawks between the Nate stuff um, early in the afternoon. And again, the Hawks were up by 15 points in this game. They were in command. They were favored in this game. They were even more so. I, I didn't look at the live betting line at BetOnline. Uh, but with the Hawks up by 15 in the second quarter, I would imagine they were a very, very large favorite to win this game. And they lost it kind of going away at the end. So I'm not going to go uh, crazy in the positive sense. I know I often bring people back kind of the middle some, some, some along the way. I'm not going to tell you that the sky is falling. I know I've seen a lot of negativity from Hawks fans, but I don't blame you. It's not been a good month. I'm sure everyone involved is ready to turn the page on December, turn the page on this on this calendar year and get into 2023. But uh, you know, we'll see how this goes. The Hawks still have more than a half season to go to right the ship, but uh, a lot of questions for sure at this stage. All right. Thanks for listening to the podcast tonight, everybody. I really appreciate it. And uh, for the last time this year, barring something crazy, Tomorrow, I will not be recording on New Year's Eve. So please um, stay tuned for 2023. Please subscribe to the podcast across podcast platforms. Lockdown Hawks can be found at Apple Podcasts and Spotify, Stitcher, Odyssey, Google Play. We're also on YouTube. So if you are an, an audio listener, I don't blame you. I, I kind of prefer audio podcasts as well. But video-wise, it would help us to click around there and subscribe and tell your friends about the podcast so they can all find the show in 2023. Ratings and reviews as well. Follow the show on Twitter at Locked on Hawks. Follow me on Twitter at BT Roland. I also write about the Hawks at patreon.com slash BT Roland as well. Sincerely, to everyone listening to the podcast, thank you for making it this far in this show and also checking out the podcast all the time. We'll see you all 